Welcome to your third Marshall Lecture. Um, if for those of you who were here, you had your first Marshall Lecture. We had Stefan Chambers, our director of the Marshall Institute, who will be coming up at the end of today's session, who told you that um, to be a philanthropist is defined as being someone who donates of their skills, their time or their money, making each of you surprisingly, shockingly a philanthropist. And then an entrepreneur as someone who makes creative use and gets stuff done without controlling or owning the means to get stuff done. Making each of you potentially an entrepreneur. So everyone was super excited after that first lecture, if we remember correctly. And then the second lecture came and uh, Will McCaskill and Stefan Chamber showed us just how difficult it is to actually get stuff done and make social impact. Um, I was, um, had sort of nightmares about that play pump that everyone was really <laughs> excited about, this beautiful thing that thought, well, this is an innovation, this is fantastic, and it's absolutely useless. Doesn't help the communities get water, actually becomes a burden to the communities. And so it kind of humbled us and made us think about the value of other important ways of understanding how we make social impact. In tonight's lecture, we're going to ask you to take a step back and think about the underlying motivations of yourself and of others, of anyone who we would put as a philanthropist or entrepreneur, which we sort of establish potentially is everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nava Ashraf. I'm the director of research at the Marshall Institute and a professor of economics in the economics department. Soon I'm going to be inviting up Professor Sir Julian Legrand, who is going to speak to us about if not profit, then what. And then the two of us will run a Q&A with all of you. But by way of introduction, I just want us to take a step back and I want you all to be thinking about your first economics class. So we're here at the LSC. I'm assuming almost everyone has had an economics class at least one. And I want you to think about whether it was made explicit to you or not, what the assumptions about human nature were that were taught in that first class. Usually, students will come out of that first class with the standard central assumption that along with rationality, people are motivated primarily by self-interest. That is, self-interest provides a tremendous motivating force within our utility function, and then we use rationality to maximize that utility function. I think this, the, the quote that every economics student, if you're going to take one quote from Adam Smith that you will know from the Wealth of Nations, it's this one, which is that self-interest is amazing because not only is it fantastic, but through market mechanisms provides us with what we need. So it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, or the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of their, our own necessities, but of their own advantages. And it's through that appeal to self-interest that we can get the goods and services that we need in our economy. And through the laws of supply and demand, the self-interest is disciplined by the market mechanisms and turns into the services we need. The thing about this assumption is that it, it, you know, it starts as a simplifying assumption that is actually very useful and is really the reason that I at least think this combined with rationality, why economics became, you know, in our first lecture we talked in the Q&A about why did economics become such a predominant social science. And in large part, it was because rational self-interest, which used to be an unpredictable passion and a vice, became something that was predictable and it made economic models tractable. And that be made economics a dominant social science. 
The problem is that when it's taught in economics classes as a standard descriptive, it becomes almost a normative prescription. So you all might be surprised that your professors in your first Econ 101 classes are shocked when they realize that students think that the way to be rational in the class is to act on behalf of self-interest when you do game theory or other things. And, and that actually turns into people who are socialized in some way to think about self-interest. And then how we teach economics in business schools and the business schools who end up teaching how to design incentives. So Julie, Professor Legrand will talk a lot about how those incentives might interact with this pro-social motivation. But the key I would like you to kind of think about is how these assumptions that we have about human nature are not innocuous because they lead to our pres normative prescriptions and the designs of our institutions and our incentives. And you know what? They may not even be accurate. Because Adam Smith, that same Adam Smith, in the beginning of his second book, started the book with this statement. That how selfish soever a man may be, supposed, there is evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him. Though he derives nothing from it except for the pleasure of seeing that happiness. The greatest ruffian, the most hardened violator of society, is not without it. So that comes from Theory of Moral Sentiments from the first book in the first chapter, um, which he was writing simultaneously to Wealth of Nations. The problem with this moral sentiment is that it can be fickle and unpredictable and not disciplined by the market or any other forces. And we'll talk a lot about that. But I want to just leave you with that idea that there could be principles in our nature from all distribution of humanity that render the happiness of others necessary to us. And then if we take that assumption and change our underlying assumptions of human nature and our standard economic models, what that might imply about the incentives and institutions that we create. And so with that, I'm going to invite an extraordinary member of our faculty up to speak to us. Professor Sir Julian Lacrande is a fellow of the British Academy is trained as an economist and has been professor of social policy here at the LSE um, for many, many years. We have been incredibly lucky and fortunate that since 2015, he has become a central member of the Marshall Institute. Professor Sir Julian Legrand, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, um, Always, uh, always start by doing a strip tease. Uh, <laughs> I remember when the, uh, actually when the director of the LSE, um, we had a director of the LSE called uh, Anthony Giddens, who some of you may know. I remember he was giving a talk once, and he did say, I'm going to do something which no director has ever done, which is start off with a strip tease. And he, he was the kind of man you think, it's just conceivable that, um, that actually he could do it. I was, on, <laughs> I was on the platform with him, and I quivered gently. You know, <laughs> Uh, and he took off his jacket, fine, and then he took off his shirt. <laughs> and I was really quivering at this point. But underneath, underneath it had um, a, a T-shirt on, and the T-shirt said, uh, the LSE, the place to be. <laughs> and so you're all in the place to be. Uh, and, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit about Marshall, uh, the Marshall Institute, and um, the sort of work we, we're doing and looking at. Um, and I may say, I mean, Nava said some very nice things about me, but we are immensely privileged to have Nava uh, on board as part of our, part of our team. Um, and uh, uh, I fully anticipate the Nobel Prize will not be so very long in coming. Uh, uh, and uh, we're... Uh, uh, anyway, let's, let's, take, let's move forward. We're talking about motivation, as Nava has pointed out, and two kinds of motivation. Um, and what I want to talk about is how those motivations might clash or how they might interact with one another and create problems for, for policy makers, for employers, uh, and, uh, for the, uh, <coughs> and for generally for the, for the, for the way we organise economy and society in operation. Now let's have a go here, let's see if we can... 
Um, now, um, blood donation. I'm going to go through a series of examples here, and I just want you to think a bit about them, and I'll come back to them. Blood donation. Um, suppose the health service of the country in which you are, happen to be uh, the uh, Minister of Health for uh, is running out of blood. It's running out of blood for transfusion purposes. Relies heavily on a donation system, a voluntary donation system. Um, and two economists come forward and say, now wait a minute, there's a real problem here. You've tried all the methods of exhortation to try to improve, to encourage blood to be donated. Um, it ain't working. I'll tell you what, why don't we set up a market? Why don't we put in a market in blood? Why don't we uh, offer to buy, to basically to, um, uh, to buy blood um, from willing donors? Um, uh, just off the top of your heads, how many of you would go for that, go for a system like that? Okay, quite a, a few, a few. How many would, would reject it under all circumstances? A rather larger, rather large number, but nonetheless, but not everyone. Um, okay. All right, next one, nuclear waste, nuclear waste disposal. Um, uh, you're, you live in a particular, um, uh, let us say, a canton in Switzerland. You'll realise why, so it's that in a minute. Canton in Switzerland, um, and you've been asked to vote for whether you'd have a nuclear waste disposal uh, in, your, in your canton. Not, not right next door to you, but nonetheless, reasonably close. How many of you would vote for it? Mm. <laughs> not a lot, not a lot. Uh, okay. Um, try this one. Um, plastic bags. Um, uh, a charge has been introduced in cla under plastic bags, as, as we all know. Uh, and um, uh, how many of you would actually um, willingly pay that charge and also... Um, uh, nudge you towards not using your plastic bags elsewhere. I would imagine probably most of us uh, operate in that way, but yes, most, most indeed are. Um, nursery school. You're running a nursery school and the parents, god damn them, are always turning up late. <laughs> Endlessly. Are they... Um, <coughs> Uh, and uh, you appeal to them, you appeal to their better nature, you exhort them, and they still carry on turning up late. And so you introduce a fine, a fine that if they, if they, if they bring their children late, you find them. Um, so uh, what would you expect to happen as a result? Do you expect, would you expect to happen that most, uh, most parents turn up uh, on time and pick up their children? Well, the very fact I've asked the question suggests to you there might be a surprise answer. So we'll, but we'll come to that in a minute. So if you just think about those, those examples and all those, those cases and just think about your own reactions to them, um, let's go through them and I will come back to them and we'll talk, we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, but they all illustrate in some way this kind of clash of motivations that I'm talking about and how it goes through. Oh, of course... Um, one has to have a picture these days uh, of you know who, um, uh, and um, you probably also have to have uh, also that particular quote. Can people remember what that quote was about? Taxes. Taxes. Yes, that's right. Uh, I don't pay taxes, and that makes me smart. Again, that's a very useful illustration of, of one of the th phenomena I want to talk about. So. Um, let's can move on to some nicer people. <laughs> um, first of all, on the, uh, uh, here we have David Hume, um, uh, an, or pretty much a contemporary of uh, Adam Smith, who we heard earlier. Um, and, um, and on the right here, we have uh, Richard Titmus. Richard Titmus was um, a professor here at the university, uh, at the LSE. He was actually the last professor... Uh, ever to get a, um, uh, a chair at the LSE without even having an undergraduate degree. Um, a remarkable man, as we'll, we'll see in a minute. Um, now, they both had, they both in some sense represent different views of the world. Uh, the views of the world of David Hume um, are encapsulated uh, by this particular quote, uh, in contriving any system of government, 
Uh, every man, they only had men in the 18th century, I'm afraid, <laughs> that's clear. Uh, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other end uh, in all his actions than in private, than private interest. So the only thing, the only thing, particularly in government, uh, people in government are assumed to be entirely self-interested, basically. They are knaves. Knaves, for those of you who are not native English speakers, is a kind of, it's an old-fashioned English word. It means somebody who's self-interested, uh, possibly even slightly crooked in some way. But um, uh, anyway, a knave, basically a self-interested individual. And by this interest we must govern it, and by means of it, notwithstanding his insatiable avarice and ambition, I wish people wrote like that these days, <laughs> insatiable avarice and ambition, cooperate to the public good. Okay. Um, now, so his view of the world essentially was one where people are largely, indeed almost entirely, motivated by self-interest, or rather like the first quote that we saw um, from Adam Smith that Narva put up. Um, uh, now, for those of you, the Hume scholars in the audience, will know that I'm traducing him a bit here. Um, actually, he goes on to, res to, to, to retract this, or to move back from it. Um, uh, however, nonetheless, it is a very common, common view of the world, common view of the world that, that basically uh, human beings are fundamentally self-interested, and we just have to accept that fact, and we have to work with it accordingly uh, and organise things appropriately. Um, Richard Titmus, on the other hand, um, Richard Titmus um, uh, had a, a quite different view. Um, and it came about like this. What happened was, and uh, here we come to blood donation, um, two economists, uh, the, sorry, the NHS was going through one of its basic crises. The NHS goes through crises. It's every three years. I think it's a cycle about every three years. Um, on this occasion, it was in the uh, <coughs> late 1960s, it was going through a crisis of uh, no blood no blood available for transfusion purposes. Um, and two economists, um, uh, <coughs> Tony Collier and Michael Cooper, wrote um, a little piece for the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is a, uh, a market-oriented think tank, to uh, argue that, well, the answer is surely to let's, let's, have, let's have a market, let's pay, let's pay for it. We've got this shortage, let's pay people to provide it. You'll still get the donation, blood, and then we get a bit extra on that's paid for. Fine, excellent. Um, Timmer was horrified by this, um, and he wrote um, a magisterial book called *The Gift Relationship*, um, and uh, which um, uh, <coughs> uh, basically, uh, well, I think it did tear, tore the economists apart. Um, the um, uh, it got. Um, I remember talking to Tony Kalia, one of them was a friend of mine. And he said it was like being run over by a steamroller. Um, it was a very influential book, this gift relationship, and it was actually picked up by, of all people, talking of American presidents, by Richard Nixon. Um, and um, talking of dubious American president. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and it was very influential, and I shall come back to that, come to that in a bit. But Richard, in, in his book, The Gift Relationship, he had this quote, uh, and basically what he was arguing was that it is a very important... Sociological, I think he meant social, not sociological. I think it's anything to do with sociology. It was a social and biological need to help. So it's a biological need to, to help, to be altruistic. So far from self-interest being the fundamental motivation, there is, a fun, there, is, there is the only fundamental motivation. There is also, and maybe even more important, a more fundamental motivation, desire to help. Um, um, now, um, so we've got these two... Two views of the world, um, the Titmus view of the world and what I'll call the Hume view of the world, um, that uh, people are primarily self-interested in the Humean world and that, that individuals, if, uh, not necessarily they're primarily altruistic, but have a very strong element of altruism uh, working through their, uh, their, uh, <coughs> working through their, uh, their, their, their behaviour. Um, Incidentally, I should say that, uh, that I, what I will call this element of altruism, uh, in contrast to a knave, basically, Titmus was saying, in contrast to Hume saying that everyone is a knave, Titmus uh, is saying everyone is a knight. Uh, and I shall use the phrase knightly motivations and knavish motivations to mean self-interested motivations and um, uh, <coughs> uh, altruistic motivation. Okay. Now... Um, 
the fact that, they, that, that these two motivations exist, and I don't think anyone would actually realistically, outside the Humean or the Titmus camps, would argue that both motivations don't exist. They clearly do. Um, but it can lead to problems, and it can lead to this, prob this phenomenon called crowding. Um, and crowding is basically the impact on nightly motivation of introdu the introduction of knavish incentives. And I'll talk a bit what I mean by that in a moment. Um, uh, if the impact is negative, so that the introduction of nightly motivation, such as, let's say, the introduction of payment for a blood donation, um, uh, if the impact of that is negative, so the result is that someone's nightly motivations are, in a sense, crowded out, uh, are, are impacted in a negative fashion, um, then we call it, indeed, crowding out. And if the impact is positive, so that actually the introduction of these outside incentives, these knavish incentives, to uh, actually crowd in um, uh, positive uh, uh, ways of proceeding. Uh, the crowding, crowd in the, the behaviour concern. Um, now let's go, the evidence... I think on whether crowding out and crowding in exists, I think it's fair to say, is mixed. Um, let's, go back to, let's go back to some examples. Let's start off with the, the blood donation example. Um, Tim has actually made a number of points about blood, um, uh, why he, di he didn't like the idea of a market for blood. One of the, one of the nicer points, I thought, was the fact that it would be, a, it would be redistributive, um, that the poor would sell the blood and the rich would buy it. So the rich would be literal blood suckers. Um, um, uh, and he also made the point, which is an interesting point, particularly for economists and those of you who know about the phenomenon of adverse selection, that he was one of the ones to first introduce the idea of adverse selection. This was essentially the problem that at the time there was no test, for, uh, you couldn't test donated blood for hepatitis B. Um, so you had to rely on the honesty of the donor to tell you whether he or she had had hepatitis B in the past, because if you did transfer that blood, it would be very, very dangerous for the, uh, for the individual's concern, for the, for the recipient's concern. Um, now, under a donor system, the incentive structure, of course, is to tell the truth, because you want to help the person concerned. Um, under a market system, the incentives are precisely reversed, the incentives are to actually conceal the information. And so you'll get, end up with a situation of, bad, of, of people supplying bad blood, and bad blood will eventually drive out good, um, which is essentially the phenomenon that, uh, uh, that, that was a later Nobel Prize winner in economics, George Akerlof, was to draw attention to the problem of, of adverse selection. Um, there has been some evidence, um, uh, not a lot, on, on blood donation. And it has to be said that actually... Uh, it ain't very strong. It doesn't look as though Titmus was right. When you've introduced financial incentives, and it's been done, there have been some laboratory experiments, there have been some field experiments in the field, um, in Italy and the United States, uh, and uh, when you introduce a type of incentive, uh, you do actually get a positive, um, a positive increase in the amount of blood being provided, sometimes 20, 30 percent, quite, quite significant. There's an interesting example in uh, uh, the, the type of incentive, it doesn't necessarily mean a financial or direct financial incentive. In Italy, for example, uh, donors were given a, um, a one day's unpaid, sorry, one day's paid leave um, if they blood donated blood. And it did have a significant and a positive impact upon blood donation. Um, so, uh, a better example is perhaps the nuclear waste example. Uh, this is, um, there's a um, uh, uh, distinguished Swiss economist um, called Bruno Frey, uh, who did an experiment asking, he, he discovered this, that the, uh, Switzerland was to try, uh, trying to find a place to dispose of its waste, nuclear waste. I can't imagine why Switzerland would need nuclear power. You'd think that Hydro hydroelectric power would be quite sufficient for all its needs. But anyway, um, they were trying to find out what was... Um, uh, and uh, they did ask various cantons, um, would you vote uh, in favour of having nuclear waste disposal in, in your 
in your canton? Um, well, this being Switzerland, uh, about 50% said yes. Um, they would be. Um, he then um, asked um, a similar group, um, would they, what would their be reaction if they were offered some compensation? Uh, if they, and the comp they were offered various sums of compensation, sometimes quite high, equivalent to a month's salary, for example. To, uh, and he would have predicted, or he did indeed predict, that that would increase the vote from 50% to, I don't know, 75% or whatever. In fact, it halved it. The vote actually going down to about 24% of people were prepared to. It could have been because the offer of compensation made people think it was more risky. Um, he did try and test for that, and he looked for, uh, he did ask people's perceptions of risk and so on, and found rather little, and found that the, the perceptions of risk didn't really change a great deal uh, on being offered the money as opposed to uh, not being offered the money. Um, so he concluded there was significant evidence there of crowding out, that the crowding out of the, the motivation to do good, to be, to be a good citizen and accept the, the no yoke waste disposal in your backyard, so to speak, and um, uh, was significantly diminished by the impact of it between offering money. Um, oh, so I'll just wait a minute, I'll just carry on with some of the um, examples. Um, plastic bags. Um, we did some research. Uh, I, Giles Atkinson, um, a colleague here and a PhD student of mine, Kate Disney, did some research looking at um, the impact of a charge of plastic bags that Marks and Spencer's um, had introduced. Marks and Spencer had introduced it before it was compulsory, uh, and um, it was able, they introduced it in some areas and not in others. So we were able to look at um, some sort of testing uh, of what happened in the areas where they did not introduce it, and they did. Uh, un not unexpectedly, the, the imposition of the charge did lead to a significant, significant fall in the use of plastic bags or an increase in the reuse of plastic bags in the areas where it was charged. Um, but what it also led to, some, possibly a little to our surprise, was an increase, excuse me, an increase in the reuse of plastic bags in other shops, other shops that were not charging. In other words, what we saw was a kind of crowding in, the, the, of crowding in of the impact. That Although there was no charge around uh, for using in certain areas, nonetheless, the, the impact of the imposing the charge in Marks and Spencers led to um, a significant favourable behavioural change in other areas too. Um, the nursery school. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, <coughs> as I say, they introduced the nursery school. They introduced a fine in order to persuade people to um, bring their children in earlier uh, or to pick up their children on time, more accurately. And the result was, as you will have guessed by now, that actually um, many more parents simply arrived late. Um, uh, now... So we get their example and illustration of crowding out. Um, now, there are various other examples. Um, I think it has to be said that there are cases where um, you have not observed crowding out where you would have expected to observe crowding out. Um, Nava has done some very interesting research with Oriana uh, Bandiera from the Economics Department here, um, looking at the use of, the use of different incentives to motivate a public health programme, and she might tell us a little bit about that. Um, very interesting because the results showed, I mean, interesting that uh, uh, cash and uh, non-financial incentives worked rather effectively, and cash incentives, I think, worked effectively in uh, actually uh, increasing the uh, performance of the agents involved in this public health programme. Um, I think we, many of us would have expected there to be a crowding out phenomenon there. We don't observe it. And indeed, actually, throughout the labour market, um, there is not an enormous amount of evidence to suggest that, um, that crowding out occurs. Um, it's quite interesting. Titmus got into trouble um, about this because um, Titmus used uh, his... Uh, when he talked about blood donation and the problems that blood donation... Uh, sorry, a market in blood donation would cause, he used it as a kind of general critique, a critique of capitalism overall. Um, uh, and 
indeed, and he said the problem is that once you introduce these markets, uh, it drives out the sort of altruism. It drives our altruism through. Um, so you, you really should. And the implication was, and this was picked up by the nurses, uh, you should pay medical professionals relatively little, particularly nurses. Because otherwise, because if you pay them a lot, you will, start, you will drive out their altruism. Um, uh, and we can't have that. Um, and you got, not surprisingly, the nurses got quite upset about this. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, Nava has been telling me that something not dissimilar has been happening in some uh, developing countries, so it would be very interesting to hear a bit more about that. Um, so, we've got a variety of phenomena going on here, a variety of things going on. Uh, what are the possible explanations for it? Well, and that's the kind of work we're doing. Now, I don't, I don't have a um, uh, uh, convincing answer on this, and hopefully maybe in a year's time, when you can all come back, Yes, time we'll have the answer, but let's put some of the ideas. Um, psychologists tend to fo focus on uh, something called self-determination theory, which, and they argue that what's going on with crowding out is uh, that people feel their autonomy is being impinged on, that their freedom of action is being impinged on, that, that if somebody, if, if an external incentive is offered, a price, uh, a payment, uh, or whatever. They, they feel in some way that they're being, they're being uh, shanghaied into doing this. The, the, fo the focus of control moves outside themselves. Um, I put up some numbers here, and incidentally, I think we're, we're putting these up on the website, uh, and some, some names up, I should say. Uh, and if you want to follow it up, you can uh, either check with me or uh, Google the various names involved. Um, um, two economists, uh, Bernard Bernabeau and Jean Thérault, um, have, uh, have a different theory, uh, one which is basically the impact on reputation. They, they argue that people are, are concerned, not surprisingly, to, that people think of them as themselves as altruistic, that the outside world thinks of them as altruistic. Uh, and they also have, they like to think of themselves as altruistic. And they think if they're paid for something, that could damage that reputation and damage that thought that, that, that people, if people know that they're being paid to do it, uh, this apparently altruistic activity, but they're actually paid for it, they think that'll damage their reputation. And even if people don't know it, actually it's signal, it signals to them that they are, they're not being altruistic in the way that they, uh, that they <coughs> consider to be um, appropriate. Um, uh, now for the truth, um, this is, um, this is uh, 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 the correct theory, um, <laughs> which is that there's a notion of a sacrifice. Um, that, uh, and here it's quite useful distinguishing different kinds of altruism or different kinds of nightly motivation. Uh, there is so-called pure altruism, or uh, <coughs> what I call act irrelevant nights, I'll explain that in a moment, Pure altruism is when you, you care about somebody and you care, you'd like to see their well-being improve, somebody other than yourself well-being improve, but you don't mind who does it. If somebody else does it, um, that actually improves your well-being by as much as if you do it yourself. So you don't care. Um, this is contrasted with impure altruism where it does matter if you do it yourself, that you really want to, you really want to do it yourself. You get what's called a warm glow. Um, out of actually being the person who does it, does it themselves. This is what I call an act uh, uh, relevant night, where the act itself, the act of altruism itself is important. Most of the evidence, such as it is, is that, that we are all impure altruists, or most of us are impure altruists. We like to do it ourselves. And incidentally, I don't know how many of you were at the William McCaskill uh, talk last week, but... It's, it's one of the mistakes he makes, I think, is that he tends to think, he tends to believe that there are pure altruists, um, and uh, he, he rather he downgrades the importance of actually being the volunteer yourself, actually being the person yourself who does the, who does the act uh, and concern. Um, okay, if one buys this, that there is impure altruism, there are act irrelevant nights, um, What's going on? Why is it that they, um, uh, and why would a knavish incentive, um, the introduction of a knavish incentive impact on this? Well, it reduced the sense of sacrifice that people have 
in making uh, an altruistic act. The point, uh, it, people get the warm glow or get the feeling of satisfaction. Warm glow is a slightly put downy term, actually. I think it's a slightly patronising term. And people get the satisfaction, get the sense of well-being from helping somebody else. And, and they feel that if they're, go, if they're go making a, a, some sort of sacrifice to do it, in some sense there's a more genuine component of altruism than if they don't make a sacrifice uh, to do it. And hence, the introduction of a market or the introduction of payment for blood donation, for instance, it reduces the sense of sacrifice that people have and the sense of, um, and so it reduces their motivation to be altruistic. It's interesting, this is, a, this is a complete reversal of the normal price theory in economics, for those of you who are economists, uh, where you'd say the, the, uh, the <coughs> fall in the cost of an altruistic activity would lead to an increase in the, uh, this in the activity. What I'm arguing here is that an increase in the cost, the fall in the cost of an acti altruistic activity will actually increase the amount of the activity undertaken um, <coughs> uh, because, uh, sorry, it will reduce the uh, amount of the activity undertaken because it reduces the amount of sacrifice you're making. Up to a point, um, and we might come back to that later on. Um, I think there are problems um, with all of these theories, um, not um, uh, including, sadly, uh, the Lagrange theory. Uh, <coughs> they're not very good at explaining crowding in. Um, you can twist them in various ways, I won't go through it, to, to describe the crowding in, but they're not, they're not very good at crowding in. There's something obviously going on there, crowding in as well. Um, and they're not good at explaining the nursery school example. Um, you remember the nursery school example where the fine, a fine was imposed on uh, late parents. Um, the parents remained late. In fact, more of them became late. And, big, and the ones that were late became even later. Um, it's difficult to explain those. Again, you can probably contrive some stories to sort of to get round those uh, to, to explain them, but it's not, it's not easy to uh, take through. Um, uh, my colleague, also working at, um, at Marshall, Jonathan Roberts, um, has his idea is uh, somewhat different. Uh, that what's going on is that, that we all have different identities in different contexts. Um, in, when we're in a supermarket, we're a consumer. Um, when we're um, <coughs> engaging in blood donation, we're being a moral being. We're being a, a good citizen or whatever. Um, and his argument would be that what you see in the case of the nursery school example is a switch um, from one identity to another, one set of roles to another set of roles. That, uh, that from being a, uh, a, a, a good citizen, or rather thinking of yourself as a citizen and being rather ashamed that um, you're not fulfilling the moral requirement to pick up your children at a certain time, you might also think you're not being a very good parent. Um, you're, uh, you switch to... When the fine is levered, you switch to the fine uh, and uh, you suddenly become a consumer. You're, becoming, you're now got a market relationship. You're paying, essentially. You're paying the nursery to have them for a bit longer than you other, the children for a bit longer than you otherwise would. Um, and so what's going on then is a kind of shift. Um, it's a shift of identity that's going on. And that's really rather different, I think, from some of the others. Um, and it's one that we're exploring um, in work uh, we're doing together to see whether there's... Uh, theories there. So, variety of different theories. Um, oh, let me say um, Trump. Um, uh, I think Trump's a, that's an interesting one, and it, it relates to this. Um, I, I would hesitate to defend Donald Trump, um, but you could say that what we're seeing in that case, in that quote about making um, it's smart not to pay taxes, we've seen a shift of identity. Um, that, the, that taxation, instead of being in some sense a moral duty that you do as a kind of civil, a civil act, shows yourself your value as a citizen, um, what's become, it's become, instead it's become a game, essentially a game at which you're, you outsmart the taxman in one form or another. So you've shifted your identity from the identity, the, 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 instead of actually viewing taxation as part of the moral uh, your, your, your role, your identity as a moral citizen, 
you view it as um, a game between you and uh, another games player, uh, and your, your aim is to outsmart each other. And that's, I think, something like that is going on in the case of Trump. Um, conclusions, where are we? Well, I'm afraid it's a rather typical bland set of conclusions that uh, academics come up with. Um, the phenomena of crowding out and crowding in, they exist. They are exist and they are important. Um, they don't always exist where you might expect them, though. And uh, I think, again, that's quite a useful useful caveat to uh, bear in mind. Um, they do take different forms in different contexts. Um, and some of the theories that we've been trying, they may apply in some contexts, but not in others. The sacrifice theory might work somewhere else, the change in identity. Um, but it is very important for government policymakers, from, for government policymakers working out a policy, but not only government policymakers, employers, we're trying to work out how to pay their staff or whatever. It is important to work out exactly what is going on in each case of crowding in or crowding out, because otherwise, as we saw in the nursery case, as we might see in the blood donation case or whatever, the policy concerned will fail. So on that note, Laura, I'll finish. Wonderful. Well, thank you, um, Julian. And, and I, I mean, I, um, I think that was a great illustration of the fact that once we start to take this motivation seriously and try to incorporate it into our understanding of human nature and then our institutions, our incentives, it actually ends up becoming quite subtle and difficult. Um, but, you know, when we think about the number of decades that very smart thinkers have put into designing financial incentives correctly, so that people don't game them or that we, you know, I think now we can put that energy into designing kind of incentives that take into mind pro-social motivation correctly um, in this way. And so we're, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna open up to the audience for questions. Just one, one comment I, I wanted to make about the Israeli daycare study mm -hmm. and crowding in, as you mentioned. My, my interpretation of that uh, study in particular is that price is signaling Basically, the, the, so people thought they, they did feel bad, even though you know, appealing to their good nature to pick up their kids wasn't sufficient, but they still felt pretty bad. And then with putting a penalty on them, you told them exactly how bad they should feel, and it turned out it was probably lower than what they really felt, right? right? And so, so the price actually signaled some strong information to them about what the social penalty really was yes. and what the real cost was. And, um, and I would say that that's the exact same mechanism that can be at play when something crowds in. So in our case, with the agents um, of, that were hairdressers and barbers in, in Lusaka, Zambia, doing HIV prevention, for them, I think the financial incentives um, signaled that their work was valued. The non-financial incentives also signaled that, but both signaled that, and to that extent, it crowded in their pro-social motivation. So to the extent that you're signaling how valuable this activity is, whether penalty, bad or good, I think you can crowd in uh, pro-social motivation. I, I, I think so too. And indeed, um, there's another interesting example of where <clears throat> um, a number of voluntary carers, um, carers of people who were uh, not their relatives, not, not elderly, not parents or children or whatever, a number of voluntary carers, were asked how they would feel if they were paid, or they were doing it voluntarily, they were paid. Um, and, um, uh, and in the expectation, again, that that might actually regard as a devaluing their motivation mm. and causing them to, uh, uh, fewer of them to do it. In fact, it had the reverse impact, exactly what you just said. It had a re it revalued it. They said they felt valued as a result of being offered to pay for it. Um, and they, although, interestingly enough, they didn't like to use the language of wages. It was languages more of compensation yeah. or, or honoraria or something like that, uh, rather than the language of, of money. But yeah. that was exactly that phenomenon you're talking about, yeah. the reinforcing, the signalling of that society actually valued what they were doing. And of course, the, the, the market mechanisms like price and incentives have a huge signaling value. Mm. And so I think part of what we're talking about here is how to make the best use of market mechanisms, incorporating this aspect of human nature, which is our pro-social motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's open it up to the audience. Please let us know your name and what department you're from. Depending on students, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Stella. Oh. Hi. <laughs> 
I'm Stella Danek. I'm in the Department of Social Policy, and I'm doing HPPF, um, Health Policy Planning and Finance. Could you be a bit closer? Um, back, back. Hello. Um, I'm just going to speak. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I was actually just going to ask about exactly that. What happens if you increase um, the fines? Would um, the parents then be more likely to actually pick them up? And for what reasons? Well, presumably at some point, um, what is called in the jargon the relative price effect will begin to dominate. At some point, it, the, price, the price will become so great that self-interest will simply say, uh, <coughs> we must avoid this fine. I, I think that will occur. Um, I think that's right. And I suppose that's the, if you buy um, the interpretation that Narva was putting on it, what you're saying is that the price then comes closer to the shame price. Exactly. Uh, the shame price. So, yes, it could well be. Um, I must say, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm more persuaded by the idea of shifts of identity and shifts of, uh, that are going on here. Um, but that's a um, that's an argument we can have in different contexts. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so Alex, I'm doing the MPA here. Um, Alex, I'm doing the MPA here. Um, and so we're talking a lot about kind of penalizing antisocial behavior and how in designing those penalties you get into informational and behavioral constraints. But if you can find a way to kind of incentivize avoiding bad behavior, so something like public recognition for people who bring accounts back from the Caymans to the oh. States. Would you, something like that. Um, would you then have those same concerns about crowding in and crowding out, or is that kind of a like no one's going to start doing it because you introduce that incentive? Is that could you could you could problem? you repeat your idea? What was the idea? The the example? Yes. Would be something like so like a, a national public recognition for people with with overseas accounts who bring them back to the states. So you're not imposing a penalty. You're introducing an incentive to stop doing something antisocial. What an award to, an award for people who stop being antisocial. Sure. Yeah. Non financial reward. I mean, I think, I think this is very interesting. Um, uh, actually, Bruno Frey has, a, again, done a very interesting um, piece on, uh, <coughs> on award systems, on honour systems, and how effective they are in terms of, uh, of uh, incentivising people. And I think, and again, I mean, you, you, Nava's done work on non-financial mm. uh, forms of incentive. Um, yeah. and, um, and I think I'm finding them quite powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, re recognition can be a very powerful uh, motivator for social comparison reasons, but also because it connects you to the social externalities. But in that particular case, I think the most relevant example is actually in, um, in some experiments that they did in Bangladesh, trying to Im increase um, taxation by sending out letters saying, you know, um, if you pay your taxes on time, you will be rewarded and, and recognized publicly for this particular thing. The problem with that was, I mean, you could probably start to imagine what the problem was. W what do you infer when you realize that there's a reward being put on the, and recognition being given to the people who are uh, paying their taxes on time? You infer that basically there aren't a lot of people who are paying their taxes on time. So depending on what your beliefs were about how many people were paying, basically if you update and think that actually much less people are paying, it may even signal that the social norm is that you really shouldn't pay, even though there's a sort so the fact that there's a recognition for it ironically signals that the social norm, the average is that it's actually pretty bad. There's quite an interesting version of that that um, some of you may have received these letters that um, the set up by the Behavioural Insights Unit, um, the Nudge Unit um, in the UK, um, by which they they add a line to the uh, to the letter asking you to pay your taxes, saying 80% of people in your area, no, 90% yes. of people, pay uh, the taxes on time, and apparently it's had a remarkable impact on the extent to which people pay their taxes on time, although um, apparently it's also not true. Yeah. So so. Um, that is the danger of using social comparison. So you could use those. People are affected by social comparison, but it's entirely dependent on what your prior beliefs are. Um, so that 80% is not true, but, it, but you know, it's, that's why it's updating people upwards um, in terms of their beliefs about more people than they think paying the taxes. All right, go ahead. Um, my name is Zach. I'm in the MPA as well. Uh, how do we extend this conversation to firms? Uh, how do we 
uh, how do governments uh, may m motivate firms to have more uh, uh, pro-social behavior, either financially or otherwise? Uh, and or is it the government's job to do that? It, essentially, beyond the benefit companies get uh, from their shareholders from having a CSR profile, uh, what other ways could you incentivize firms to kind of act in the same way that we've experimented at the individual level? It's a good question, uh, and, and not subject to an easy answer. There, there is a view that, of course, that firms, in some sense, should not behave morally or should not behave um, so responsible, that their job, uh, as dictated by the shareholders, is to maximise profits, and that's what they should do, and that the morality takes place somewhere else. Again, in a way, this is part of the, sort of the different identities exactly. role, that, that if you're in a corporate role, and your identity, your identity is to is to pursue the objective that has been set, um, uh, and I mean it's a respectable point of view. I'm not sure I I, I don't buy it. It yeah. seems to me, that, yes. Sorry. Because exactly where it breaks down, sorry, Rob, is is exactly where. So that I think has been how we've thought about firms for a long time, but but if if what the idea is to maximize shareholder value, and then suddenly you have shareholders who care about more than just profits, then maximizing shareholder value means caring about more than just profits. And then if you have employees who care more about profits, or you have customers who care about social impact, mm -hmm. then suddenly what you're trying to maximize as a firm changes. And then your internal incentives, so I'm not sure it has, I mean, I'm curious actually your thoughts about the role of government in that process, because in, in the, in the three-pronged thing that I just mentioned, if you have customers, employers, and shareholders who care about social impact, then that internally imposes a different objective function on the, on the firm, and you wouldn't need anything from the government side, but... No, that's true. Um, well, probably the most effective method is sitting them in front of Margaret Hodge, um, who was uh, chair of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, when Amazon and Google were in front of, uh, in front of her and uh, um, uh, engaging tax avoidance. Did, did, did anybody see that particular session? It was, it was very, and basically, um, uh, Google and uh, Amazon said, uh, we are, we, we, yes, we, we do, uh, Maximum. We are very tax efficient, is the phrase. <laughs> We're very tax efficient, um, uh, and um, uh, and we conform exactly to the legal requirements or whatever. Uh, we are not behaving illegally, and Margaret Hodge said, "No, you're behaving immorally." And um, and I think it was quite effective, although I still don't think that Google and Amazon are paying a great deal. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think in some ways. I'm not sure the government can do a great deal. I think you're right. I mean, it, it's a change in the culture and the club. And to some extent, it is one, I think, that we are seeing at the moment. I think you are seeing a lot of uh, corporates um, very interested in corporate social responsibility. Um, you are seeing um, a group of, uh, uh, of uh, wealthy individuals engaging in philanthropic activity um, of a very, uh, a very pronounced kind, a very important kind in some cases, um, um, with Gates, for example, on malaria. Um, so I think, to some extent, in a way, the uh, the, the change is occurring um, in a very welcome uh, direction. Mm. Uh, we have a hand back there. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Francesca. I study the, in the Master of Comparative Politics, and. Um, when you were talking about the nursery school, um, first of all, this is all very new to me, but when you're talking about the nursery school, you said that paying a lot to nurses would uh, drive out the altruism. So I want to ask if you believe that um, incentives and altruism vary in inverse kind of proportional regression. So when you have a lot of one, it means that you cannot have the other. Well, certainly that's what Titmus believed. I, I rapidly say that I, I, it's, not, it's not necessarily my belief that we should pay nurses little to rely on their altruism. Um, but it was, that was the problem that, that, that Titmus encountered with his book um, and with the, the uses that were made of his book. I'm not sure he himself actually said nurses should be paid little. But nonetheless, it was an inference that was drawn from his book. Um, well, Yes and no is the answer. I mean, there clearly are cases where they, I mean, the, and the Swiss example, the, the nuclear waste example, where you do get crowding out and fairly unequivocal crowding out, um, and where a spirit of altruism was actually, in a sense, diminished as a result of um, the introduction of knavish or financial incentives. And on the other hand, you do see, and Nava's example of the, um, uh, of the HIV programme, uh, examples where you've got 
quite substantial financial and non-financial incentives, um, and yet it does not appear to have damaged the, uh, the altruism. In fact, I think it was the pro-social people the, who were actually even more motivated exactly. by, the, by the payment. So in that sense, we got crowding in. Yeah. So unfortunately, there's no simple uh, answer to your question. Sometimes, yes, it is inverse, sometimes not. But, and, and I think where we need to go in terms of our understanding, both in research and in practice, is to understand how people, how paying incentives and the process of getting paid changes your interpretation of your own motivations. And that's why I was thinking about the information effect, but also I think this leads to the identity it's effect that you were talking about and the switching effect. So to what extent does it trigger a switch, say an identity, or signal something? about how you should be behaving. Um, and, and that requires a lot of deep understanding of the context. I mean, I think in the, the reason why it the crowded in in Zambia was that you know, people didn't interpret suspicion from the fact that they were getting paid. They felt actually that it, 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 it was a recognition of the importance of the work. So it was saying people are willing to put money where their mouth is, basically, and value the work that we're doing. Um, and that's where you really, if you're working in practice, you're going to want to really understand how that plays out in the context you're looking at. And if you're in research, you're going to want to really deeply understand the but dynamics you, uh, there. You, you were telling me you are getting governments using the TITMUS kind of argument. All the time. All the time. So in developing countries, the... Especially, for example, there's been a massive debate. As, as you all probably know, there's a very large resource crisis, human resource crisis in health in terms of providing health services to remote areas around the world, including in the US, by the way. And one of the biggest challenges is, is what do you do? And then there's a real movement to use volunteers as the providers of this health and to not pay the volunteers precisely as a way to select the kind of people who are most motivated by altruistic motivation because they're the ones who are going to be willing to sacrifice the most and therefore must have the most motivation. And that is used as a policy argument for not paying people whose full-time job is actually providing health services to other people. Hi, I'm Frances. I'm doing the MPA as well. Um, my question is going back to this um, philanthropy idea and actually connecting it to the lecture we had last week as well. Um, and this idea of sacrifice and um, being altruistic, whether it's uh, volunteering and getting maybe more of the warm glow from really having a hands-on experience versus just giving money um, and looking at the difference between those two things. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen in a lot of cases that actually sending people to volunteer maybe isn't as effective and that actually just money is the most effective. So is there a way of de designing incentives for people to just give cash mm -hmm. um, that can kind of enhance and crowd in that sort of warm glow effect? Well, I think, I think the problem with it is, I mean, the logic of what you said is, is impeccable. Um, yes, and it's what McCaskill says too, basically that, that um, uh, basically, if your skill is being, um, uh, if, you're, if you've got altruistic motivation, but your skill set lies in being a banker, go and make millions being a banker, and then give the money away. Uh, and, that, and that'll be far better than going out and building some tottering hut um, <laughs> with, your, uh, with your useless um, abilities. And, and, in, and in, in, the, in the meantime, throwing somebody out of, out of a job. I mean, a, a proper builder out of a job. Um, and I think it's a very difficult argument to counter. Um, the only thing is that I do think it does neglect a basic feature of human nature, which is that people want to do it themselves. Now, I think it's not, it isn't only that they get a warm glow from the sacrifice, I think. I think also, actually, because it's actually rather pleasurable. I mean, young people going out and building huts in Zambia or wherever, I mean, I think they have a good time. I think it's enjoyable as well. Um, but I think... To ignore that particular aspect of human motivation, that, that really, that we are, on balance, impure altruists, that on balance we do, we, or act relevant nights, we do actually, it's the, it's the act itself that's important uh, in doing it, uh, I think is actually to make quite a big mistake. You know, the, the thing that really struck me about his perspective was this idea that 
it's a luxury for us sitting in our privileged position to want to feel this connection that we feel by doing it ourselves. And that we should essentially sacrifice that luxury to do the most effective good. Um, I think though that takes things in a very static way because basically it says in one moment in time, what is the most effective thing you could do with your money and your time? It doesn't think about the dynamic effects, for example, on innovation, if someone puts their mind and their skills to, the, to some big social problem that they want to solve. Because the answer is not, do I become a banker and give a lot of money away, or do I go and build the huts in Zambia? You know, there is a lot of in-between in which people are putting their, their, their ideas and their skills to solving very big social problems. And, um, and I think we miss that, that unlocking of that talent and that motivation by asking people to forego or, or considering it a luxury. I mean, I think this yes. is your point mm -hmm. that warm glow is really diminutive yes. as a way of understanding this force that wants us to feel connected with the social good that we're doing. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Meredith. I'm doing my master's in international development management. Um, I wanted to ask you about the nursery school example. We discussed that in one of my courses earlier. Um, and Which the, example? The nursery, the nursery school nursery, example. Nursery school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and just how that the one of the contributing factors to why the parents were willing to pick up their kids later was because they were willing to almost pay anything to ensure the fact that their kids were being taken care of and how that's not necessarily a market incentive and that's more of a personal incentive about the connection, the personal connection between a parent and a child. And I'm just kind of wondering what is your reaction to that and how do you think that that kind of pl plays into the crowding out and, and that market dynamic? I'm going to turn to Jonathan Roberts to answer that. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> Since he's in the audience, I think we might as well use his, him as a resource uh, <laughs> for the uh, for the purpose. Hello. Um, I think there are obviously multiple ways of explaining this particular case. I think one peculiarity of it is with nursery schools, you pay for time. You pay for the amount of time um, that you have your child there, a fine may be in that context a fairly weak measure because in fact what you're just doing is creating an extra charge for the hours um, that you are late. So I think there are three different perspectives going on here. One is that it becomes a movement from being pro-social to being a contractual arrangement. One is that you get extra information about the cost of what you're doing to the people who you are imposing a burden on. And that is a piece of information which makes you change your behavior. And the third thing is actually you're just realizing you're buying extra hours and the nursery has suddenly made those extra hours available to you. So I think there are three possible processes here and we need further research to work out what the particular answer is to that conundrum. Great. I'm, I'm actually curious to just ask the audience, how many people had heard about the Israeli example before this lecture? <laughs> Amazing. So, it is, it so, is. so if you think about it, and, and it's, in, it's in Michael Sandel's book, it's in, yep. and just think about all the ways in which we talked about how an Israeli daycare and nursery school may be a special context in which to introduce a fine and to understand crowd out, and then think about the extent to which it's been used to argue that crowd out is a generalized phenomenon, and even to the extent where people, people have cited that study to me for why uh, health workers in Africa should not be paid. <laughs> so, I mean, we have to get, and I think part of it, let me just say, I think it's because, honestly, it, it, it resonates with something underlying in us in terms of our beliefs about how money might be bad, or dirty, or something. I, I think there is something underlying that that makes such stickiness out of one study. I mean, what, what's amazing is even among economists, you know, academic economists, right? They did this um, study where they asked <coughs> academic economists to predict what people would do in given incentives for motivation, right? So they, they wanted to look at to what extent did they think crowd out was going to happen. And, the, and, and lots of other things that we have understood about incentives, pay performance, et cetera. The thing that across the board, economists all got wrong massively 
was they overestimated the crowd out effect. And, and in fact, when they did the experiment, it wasn't there. And so it's basically that one or two studies essentially created a, a stickiness in our belief system that people then took that and applied it across many contexts and tried, instead of trying to be more subtle in the way that we understand this interaction between financial incentives and pro-social motivation across same, the range Same is true of the Bruno Frey study, of the nuclear waste. How many people have had the nuclear waste uh, disposal one? Not, not quite as many, but is that, that's also been used very much, uh, often cited. Yeah. Um. Hi, Ashley Miller. I'm from HPPF as well. Um, I'm wondering if these observations validate the need to actually try to quantify altruism or social benefit for incorporation into cost effectiveness analysis. I'm speaking specifically from a healthcare frame. You know, in Canada, we're having ongoing debates about privatization in healthcare, and a lot of cost effectiveness analysis denies the social benefit that we obtain from a socialized healthcare system. So I'm wondering, do you foresee a future in which we can quantify social benefit? And do you think that it should be used in cost effectiveness analysis the same way an externality would be considered? Julian? No. <laughs> okay. Do you mean, just to be clear, do you, by social benefit, do you mean well-being? Do you mean like a sense of subjective well-being or do you mean social value? I guess kind of like the warm glow effect, really. I mean, yeah. personally, I feel a bit of a warm glow knowing that everyone in my country has access to health care. Um, and I, I think we could probably quantify that. I mean, the what, you know, I think I'm, I'm now going to contradict what I previously said, <laughs> which is, which is, I mean, on the one hand, I think we've, we've, we shouldn't make diminutive warm glow. On the other hand, it is fickle. <laughs> And, and the identifiable victim effect, this idea that, you know, we get really riled up about a dog that's suffering over there, but like a thousand people who've died somewhere else, we, we actually don't get upset about. You know, that, that's something that's sort of weird in us, and, and Adam Smith talked about that too. And so, so I mean, I, I do think we need to um, reflect on what's causing our warm glow so that we can discipline that instinct to some degree and harness it. Um, but, but your point is, is, is that if there is an act that creates a warm glow in other people, regardless, yeah. um, um, in the Canadian public through having, as let's say, a, um, a social insurance healthcare system, ought we to measure that and ought that to be part of the benefit from the activity? I, I suppose the answer is yes. I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think and in yeah. principle, yes. There's a centre for well-being in the economics department here at the LSE who exactly does this, incorporates subjective well-being into cost-effectiveness analysis, and it, it can certainly be done and has been done. Um, there was a gentleman up there. Oh, you may yes. have to speak very loudly. Oh, no, there, sorry, you have got a, 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 <laughs> There's someone here who really wants to speak. Love your enthusiasm, everyone. <laughs> this is great. Uh, my name is Stefan. I'm a, an international political economy student. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can maybe speak to uh, Michael Sandel, who was brought up earlier, and his argument that it's, it's the aggregate effect of, of these policies of market incentives that we should be considering, uh, because I think, on in, at the micro level, we can all you know we can all agree this these things uh, you know the paying for healthcare workers it, it makes it makes sense. But in the in the say the developed economy context, what what would you uh, have to say about the kind of macro level uh, uh, effect of these cumulative s slight tweaks um, to what we might consider areas where the market shouldn't be. Can you, can you specify what the, the, your particular concern about the macro I think level that, effect? Well, his concern, would, I'm, I'm con his concern is that the cumulative effect of all of these slight changes to allowing the market to be where it traditionally hadn't been, um, at the macro level crowds out the, these altruistic uh, tendencies. And that as we allow the market to creep into areas where it hasn't before, then we collectively lose that uh, as, as we continue. And that was very much the Titmus argument uh, in the gift relationship was that uh, if you remember the quote he had was about that um, people need opportunities to express altruism and if you close down those opportunities um, the pool of altruism itself, the stock of altruistic capital you might say, the pool diminishes uh, as a result. Um, I mean I would say is so I'm curious, actually, if you, what do you think about that? Because, because when I hear that, and when I hear this, I think, OK, well, we use the market mechanism. Don't you think we would find other ways to express our pro-social motivation? I mean, there's an infinite amount of social problems that we could put our motivation towards. 
You know, so I, I mean, I do, let me, let me say, I do think that a kind of commodification and transactional understanding of our relationship with someone we're giving to or having some kind of, you know, exchange of services with, that is problematic for lots of reasons. But that doesn't have to be tied to using the market. You see? So we can separate these things. We can use the best of, the mar of market mechanisms, but not have it imply that we have a reductionist, transactional, commodificated, uh, commo commodified experience. Uh, to reinforce that point, I mean, one of, the, one of the, um, the, the things that I found most shocking about Sandel and his book was his criticism of the use of charging for pollution for externalities, mm -hmm. um, where he felt, again, this was... Um, now, it's exactly Narva's point that um, uh, the point is, what is the alternative? Um, if there are other things that lead to crowding out, regulation, excessive regulation, heavy regulation, that leads to massive crowding out um, of, of, of uh, intrinsic motivation. Indeed, we're seeing that a lot, actually, at the moment in, in the health service and, indeed, education. We're seeing a, a very heavy degree of, um, of regulation going on um, in Britain. Uh, Ofsted in education and the um, Care Quality Commission in, um, uh, in <coughs> health, a uh, very heavy degree of regulation and having a, a demonstrably damaging effect on the motivation of professionals and intrinsic motivation. So um, I think there are going to be times when actually um, market commodification or whatever is actually superior uh, or less damaging at any rate uh, for intrinsic motivation than the alternatives. Mm. And I don't think Sandal really comes to grips with that. No. Hand up here. Right here. Hi, my name's Danielle. Um, I'm a master's student here on the Environmental Economics Program. Um, my question is, if we, um, which I think I, I would agree that there is normally a slightly self-interested nature with altruistic acts. So the, um, we care about the fact that we're the actor involved in, in, in the action. If we um, assume that, then is there a concern or is there, is there a consideration around um, this leading to either competition in trying to solve a particular problem or on the other hand, could it lead to sort of monopolization or um, a sort of very close-knitted group of people trying to solve a problem and blocking the entry of other actors who would like to try to contribute to the solution? What a good question. Um, I think, uh, yes, there may well, uh, competition to be altruistic. I think that's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, and. Um, uh, I'm rather in favor, generally I'm rather in favor of competition because um, I think it tends to lead to better outcomes than monopoly. So the idea of competing, competing to, to do good to somebody, I find rather attractive actually as, 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 a, as, a, as a mode. Now, I can, although I, one, can, one can imagine circumstances in which they damage you, you sweep at your, you're trying to help this beggar and somebody comes and sweeps you aside and, <laughs> and to grab you, they, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I can see there might be, there might be problems at that rate. But, 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 but basically, I don't, I don't I, at a fundamental level, I, do, I really think it's a, we have to acknowledge uh, the importance of act relevance we have to acknowledge the importance of the warm glow effect. Um, and if that need, does lead to competition, well, that may not be wholly a bad thing. And, and I think in, the monopoly question is very interesting because if you, if, imagine someone does it for the purpose of status, right? And imagine a number of people do it for the purpose of status. Then actually, if you develop a kind of fixed cost, like you can't be a great philanthropist unless you have some big amount that you give away or something that, you know, that, that, makes other people feel that they can't. I mean, that's what was so extraordinary about that first session, just seeing the kind of everyone's eyes say, I, I could be a philanthropist or I could be an entrepreneur. Then that changes, I think, the, the conversation. So, so I think we do need to consider the level on which we put people on pedestals or think about them in a different category um, in terms of their motivation and make opportunities for giving something that's open to everyone and available in one way or another. And that's real competition, right? That's, that's market competition. Uh, Francis, can you hear me? Yeah, no, go ahead. No, I can't. Can I, 
sorry, slightly deaf. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So this actually follows on quite nicely from that. I just wanted to ask about how far do you see the impact of sacrifice taking us? Because really how I see it, when you're talking about Titnus and how his idea, if he, if you follow on from that pure thought, really what should have happened with the blood donation is that we should have come out and said, okay, the NHS, we're in a real crisis. We're going to have to stop paying people. And then you would expect this influx of people to turn up and be like, don't worry, don't have to pay us. We will just give it for free. It's, your, it's not a yes and no, it's a yes, no, and thank you, but no. And so do you not think that kind of your argument about sacrifice and this impure altruism and the competition about it as well actually would lead to crowding in rather than crowding out because people want to seem altruistic? Well, yes, it's an interesting point. Um, the, um, uh, and it has been argued that what you should be doing is paying doctors less um, to uh, encourage them to be more altruistic and, um, and they will feel their sacrifice is greater uh, and therefore they, they will be more inclined to... to work. Um, I, unfortunately, I think before I can pick up another engineering term, um, I think that's what they call a hysteresis effect, um, which is once you've got to a particular situation, there's no going back. And, uh, and uh, Tim has actually vaguely refers to this, that there is a, um, that, that if we start paying people a lot in those areas um, and, they, and then you, you start withdrawing it, um, you won't suddenly tap into some reservoir of altruism that, that was not previously used. You'll just tap into a reservoir of resentment and anger. Um, that, um, and people, and it, it's related, I think, to the signalling point too, that, that um, people will feel actually undervalued um, and that they will feel that, that they're not being recognised and received. So um, I, it, it would be nice to think that they, well, I don't know if it would be nice to think exactly, but it would be a, um, it might be a useful policy device that, that we could increase our pool of altruism in that way, but I suspect it's not on. My name is Joshua, and I'm doing uh, my master's in urban policy. I wanted to ask you, what do you think of selective altruism? Uh, and what I mean by this is uh, the fact that, by, uh, for example, international students may prefer to go to countries or to contexts such as uh, Islam in Rio de Janeiro uh, to help uh, in, the, in the favela rather than volunteering into the local market uh, of, let's say, also volunteering opportunities. Yep, the seductive effect of other people's problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I was thinking about, you know, the need to educate that, that sentiment in us in some way, because why is it that we feel so good about ourselves and we are able to simplify some complexity that is somewhere else and think that we can do something over there but, but something is happening in our neighborhood, we're not going to actually go and, and, and be part of that. So I, I mean, my sense is that that actually, that is an impure altruism that we need to educate around. There's another example of selective altruism, which um, is, I think, um, many of us find very difficult. Um, it's the case of organ donation. Um, sometimes um, living organ donation, so the organ of a kidney, um, where the donor makes some specification about who the recipient should be, mm. and particularly often a racial um, specification. Um, and in some sense, he or she seems to think that the fact they're being engaged in an altruistic gesture enables them to overcome other moral considerations, such as the select. It's, um, but it is, it, it, it's a dilemma that does arise, actually, in many, many policy pronouncements concerning organ donation. We have time for, I think, one more question. Yes, one, one more question. Hello, my name is Maria, and I'm with the Social Policy Department, um, and I'm struggling with this idea of paying the nurses in a conversation our group had earlier about working in nonprofits. And so my thought is, if we are not financially incentivizing people to do their work, say for instance, the nurses or the doctors, are we injecting an element of privilege needed to be altruistic that isn't being financially incentivized? Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so I think, I think that the, the assumption underlying the, the argument that lower pay draw, uh, selects in more altruistic people is one, that there isn't a sort of 
problem of um, differential need for, for money because of privilege. Um, and two, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an idea in economics that we have, which is a compensating differential. So it's the same, it, the, the argument behind it is a, is, a, is a standard argument, which is like, I might go to a job where I have a really nice office and a lower salary and a nicer title, because that's a compensating differential for me. And so the argument in NGOs and doctors and nurses is the compensating differential is that I get to care for people and therefore I'm willing to sacrifice the money. What that ignores is that people, not only your point, which I think is incredibly important, which is that some people can't afford to do that, but secondly, that people might have different outside options. And, and it completely ignores that. And so the fact that you might have people that have a very high outside option and therefore a high skill set, um, and therefore would go to a higher paying job than somebody else. It, 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 so it's not going to be a, a great selection mechanism for the most caring people, as you might think. I'm going to ask our director, our a lot of director, Stefan Chambers, to come up to just um, close our session for us. It's OK. <laughs> I think you need to speak to the left hand. Okay, um, first off, um, thank you very much, um, Nava and Julian, friends and colleagues. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, second, I think you can add uh, impure altruist to your CV. <laughs> we started out three weeks ago um, with me trying to persuade you that um, you were philanthropists. Philanthropists were not simply large organizations with large pools of capital. They are anybody trying to make a positive difference in the world by voting with their time, their money, their energy, their ideas, their networks, and their emotions. Okay? And then we tried to show you that these things that present as straightforward I have capital, I give it away, the world gets better. Okay. Those are complicated questions. Questions of human motivation. Questions of crowding in or crowding out. Questions of whether markets are the best mechanism for organizing these kinds of interventions. Questions of the relative weight of regulation and markets. Questions even about whether marketization changes the nature of people's feelings about their own altruism. Questions about the fundamental nature of human kindness and motivation. These are very complicated questions. And one of the things we're trying to do in the Marshall lectures um, is to present you with something and then show you just how difficult it is. You know, the, arc, the arc of history is long and it bends towards humility. It bends towards saying, we never know enough to know definitively how best to do this. Okay? It is always important for us to get together in groups like this, in enterprises like our institute, in the research of my colleagues and others around the LSE, in order to understand this stuff better. So I'm not going to attempt to give you a detailed summary of what you've heard today, but I am going to say that this series of lectures, the Marshall Institute lectures, are precisely about creating a connection between you, your lives, your academic careers, and your future professional lives, and the impulse that we share about making the world a better place, and some mechanisms for doing so as intelligently, as thoughtfully, as humbly, and as decisively as we can. So that is my message. Okay? It's not as simple as, are we good people, are we bad people? It's not as simple as, is the market definitely the best way to organize ourselves? It's not as simple as, and then take your pick. And we saw last week with effective altruism. On the face of it, my altruism trumps your altruism if my altruism is more rational. Okay? But I could tell from the climate, from the, from the feeling in the room, that a lot of you resisted that. And resisting it is a good thing, uh, in my view. So I want to wish those of you from 
the US Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> I want to wish the rest of you um, some peace and rest between now and our next lecture. I want to remind you that on the 17th of January at 6.30, um, our founder, Sir Paul Marshall, will be the fourth Marshall Institute lecturer, and that will be worth listening to. And I want to leave you um, with the simple observation that 100% of your peer group always returns to these lectures. Thank you very much. <laughs>